Everybody, my name is Chaim Yagoda. Welcome to the class. Today we're discussing, as you see on the board, ID info. Anybody know what that means? Don't worry about it. We're going to talk about it in a second. But before we start the class, we're going to go back a little bit to the intro. Everyone here for the intro today? Yeah, intro. Okay, so in the intro, you learn that you guys are the members of the jury. Yes? Up to the challenge. Okay, so we're going to be evaluating evidence, right? We're taking a look at this idea. The Jewish people have this message. They claim that there's this... I'm the lawyer, by the way. The message is that God passed the message down throughout the generations, and you are the members of the jury, and you're going to weigh the evidence to see if this is, in fact, correct or not correct. If you remember from the introduction, so it should have been mentioned that the, the yeshiva here actually mentioned, they discussed with the Mossad. Everyone here know what the Mossad is? The Mossad is the Israeli version of the CIA. They're pretty good, by the way. So anyway, they discussed with them, how do you make a decision? How do you have to know... How good of the, of the evidence do you need in order to make a real decision that this thing is actually true or not true? So there are five basic ways of verifying evidence. Anybody remember any of those five? Verifying evidence? Okay, don't all answer at once. Yeah, go ahead. One of them is ID. ID, very good. How did you know that? You know, unbelievable. <laughs> okay, so one of them, I don't know if you had codes already. We talked about encryption, right? There's a way, whenever they talk about, let's do it a little bit more specifically, the Mossad, when they have an agent working for them, Okay, a spy in another country, right? So the spy is sending the messages, they're telling them what's going on. They have to verify that the, the information is actually accurate. It's coming from the right person. It's good information. There hasn't been something messed up along the way. Okay, so there are different ways that they verify that they're getting the proper information from the right person. Okay, so one of the ideas is the encryption. That was the idea of codes. There's outside verification. What we're going to talk about today in this class is what we call... ID info is going to be the name of the class, but it is basically the idea of knowing something about the person that's sending information. So not necessarily about the way it's sent, about the encryption, but do we have some type of idea that's telling us that we can tell who is sending the message, right? In other words, the example we give is the PIN code, right? So when you go to the bank, you take your card, right? You go into the bank and you say, I want to take some money. So you have the message, you're telling them, I want the money, but they want to ascertain that the person that's taking out this money is, in fact, the right person, right? So how do you do that? You give them a PIN code, right? So the PIN code, so to speak, is telling the bank that you are the right guy who's trying to get this message. So a similar thing we're going to talk about today. We want to know the PIN code, so to speak. We want to know something about the author. The message is, again, we have this Torah being passed down. We want to know something about the author. Do we have some type of message? Do we have some type of proof that the being, that is the author of this Torah, is, in fact, the God and not man? Okay, everyone with me so far? That's going to be the topic of today's class. Okay, so we're going to start like this. If we're going to be objective, so we have two basic options of who wrote the Torah. Who are the, what are the two options? Number one? Yeah. Man, very good. Number two, woman also. Okay, come on. <laughs> man, right, right? The general, let's talk, it could be aliens, but let's limit it to men, okay? Man, mankind, or number one, and number two, it would be God. Okay, so we're going to try to figure out, we're going to look at certain excerpts in the Torah, we're going to take a look at a few different pieces parts of the Torah, we're going to try to figure out, is there a message here telling us that we have some type of PIN code, we have a clear verification that the author of this Torah is in fact God and not man. Okay, so we're going to start like this. Okay, and that's what we have over here. We got our little Torah and we want to know, written by God, what we're going to find out, right? Maybe not. Maybe it was just written by someone else. Okay, so we're going to have to figure out like this. So now, in order to, to figure this out, we're going to try to kind of compare and contrast what we would think as people we would do when we're writing the Torah to what an infinite being like a God would or could do when he or she, right, whatever that means, an infinite being is writing the Torah. Okay? So why don't we start with a little bit from the crowd. What would you, what would anybody here have any nice ideas that they would write in there? Imagine you're starting a religion, you're starting a, a group, or you want to start a nation, and you have this, you know, everyone has their 
There are laws, right? We have a lawyer here in the audience. Anyone doesn't know? My good friend over here, Ari Wasserman. Uh, okay, so we, we have, everyone has laws. Every country, every society, they have basic laws, right? So if you had certain laws that you would want to write in your Torah, what would you include there? Be nice. Be nice. Very good. Oh, that's such a nice thing. Beautiful. Okay, be nice. Anything else? Let's get a little more specific. Thou shall not kill. kill. Right? Everyone agree with that? Most bit, majority? Okay, good. Thou shall not kill. Thou shall not murder or kill. Murder is not the same. Okay. So are you also a lawyer? Are you also a lawyer? No. Okay, but, but you get what I mean. Okay, thou shall, shall not murder. Murder. You're right, you're right. Okay, very good. Thou shall not murder. Excellent. Because you have to kill, unfortunately. Yeah, that's true. That's right. Okay, anything else? Thou shall not? Worship other idols. Worship other idols. Okay, very good. What if, what, unless, your religion, unless your religion is an idol. Okay, you don't, we don't want other idols. Okay, right? Maybe do good things. Do, okay, fine. Now imagine, anybody here a farmer? No? So good. I can get away with what I'm about to say now. No one's going to stop me. Very good. Because okay, so anyway, if you study the science of farming you'll realize that it's actually not a good idea to always be working the land. It's not a good idea because if you're constantly working the land, you're going to overwork it. You're going to get to the point where, you know, it's, just going to, it's not going to be able to produce the proper amount. You need, you need to have it rest, okay? Everyone take my word for that? Makes sense? Makes sense, okay. Imagine you wanted to incorporate this in your book of law. You wanted to talk about this concept that, you know, you want to let the land lay fallow, right? How would you write that? Give it a break, okay? We'll have something called soil replenishment. That sounds very good, fancy, right? Okay, soil replenishment, okay? Anyway, I'm sure you guys learned about that. So this concept, we need to replenish. We need to let the land have a little bit of a rest, okay? How would you do that if you were writing your, your book? You got to encourage, you want to make sure that the society is going to sustain itself. So you want to tell these people, everyone just relax. I know it's hard. Take a break. What? What would you do? Day of rest, okay. A day of rest. Okay, that's good. You might say a day, okay, everybody worked the land for like five days in a row or six days into the day of rest, okay? Now let's say you can't do that. So let's say you, let's say you need a whole year of rest, which is like a little bit intense, right? I don't know if you do, but let's say you, need, let's say you wanted to give a year of rest. How would you write that? How would you do that? Because we have a, it was a, little bit, a little bit of a problem here. What's the problem with letting the land rest for an extended period of time? What? Right. You can't do that because people don't very So what would you do? What, you just gave an answer. What does that mean? What would you do? Like, rotate. rotate, right? Rotation. No problem, right? Okay, let's say everyone's going to let the land lay fallow for a year. No problem, right? The east-western part of the country will do it this year. Then the southern part will do it the next year. You do have some type of crop rotation, right? Because that would all make sense. Okay, so again, we have our soil replenishment. Imagine you had nothing going on. But imagine I told you that for some reason I want the entire land, again, we don't know why this would be, but let's say, let's just, we're just going to bring out the point here. Let's say this, we were creating this society and you wanted the whole land to lay fallow for an entire year, for whatever reason, which we don't understand that itself. But imagine you did that. How would you convince your people that they're going to be able to survive? What would you do? What would be another way to deal with that? If you're going to say, okay, nobody can work the land for a year, so what are you going to do? You say, well, it's a little bit hard to save up for a whole year. Yeah, but if everyone saves up. Okay, so maybe everyone would start saving up. That's one idea. Okay, that's a good idea. What would be another idea? Okay, I kind of gave it away on the board here. I was supposed to press that afterwards. But anyway, storage, right? Okay, so let's say you would store away maybe now import. There are different ways of doing it. So again, we have this concept of the land needs to take a rest. So if we were doing it, we would say maybe a day. Okay, a day every, few, every, every week or so or every month or so. If you needed it to be a whole year, we would probably have rotation, crop rotation, right? Very good, there it is, on the board, with crop rotation, right, if you had that. And if you couldn't do that, and you wanted, for some reason, everyone's got to do it at the same time, you know what you would say? Okay, we've got to figure out some system, don't worry. We're going to have this law in our book that the land has to lay fallow for an entire year, everybody at the same time, but we're going to work it out. We're going to save up, or we're going to have people, uh, you know, have an importing import-export is a good business, so we're going to get involved in that. Right, we'll have some way to figure it out. Imagine you have a law in the Torah that shows you all these beautiful fruits, and then they tell you, triple crop on the sixth year. What does that mean? Again, we're starting a religion. And in this book, we're writing, here's what we're going to write. For six years, you may plant your field, prune your vineyards, and harvest your crop. But the seventh year is a Sabbath of Sabbath for the land. It's God's Sabbath during which you may not plant your fields, nor prune your vineyards. Okay, so we have a whole year. That's going to be a little of a problem. What are we going to do? How are we going to deal with that problem? And if you ask, what will we eat in the seventh year? We have not planted, nor have we harvested crops. What's the answer? I will direct my blessing to you in the sixth year, and the land will produce enough crops for three years. 
Anybody, uh, does it make sense to anybody? Would anybody write this in their Torah? Excellent question. Very good. Did you look at this class beforehand? No. You were here last year, weren't you? <laughs> okay, so right, very good question, right? In other words, if we're, again, we're trying to, you're the people of the jury, right? Don't give your answer yet. You have to, the jury has to decide together. But at the end of the day, right, we're trying to imagine there's this law. The law, maybe the general concept of the law makes a lot of sense. We got to have the land. You want to sustain your people. You want to sustain the nation. You got to have, have some type of way of, of letting the land rest. But in the end of the year, is this the way to do it? An entire year where nobody works the land. And how are we preparing for that? It doesn't say we're going to store up. It says, don't worry about it. God will take care of the rest. Everything will be great. Okay? This is our first example of something a little bit fishy. Me being the lawyer, I am going to claim that we have a message, we have a sign, we have a little bit of a pin code here. Because if man, no matter how amazing, smart, charismatic, convincing, enough about me, that a person would come along and be able to convince people. You can't do that. You can't write that in the Torah. Nobody's going to buy it. Right? This is not, you're forgetting about what's going to happen in 100 years from now. How are you going to get people to buy into this? Okay? You're telling them, don't worry about it for a year. Everything will be great. God will have this amazing blessing, or me or whoever you claim you are, right? I will direct my blessing to you in the sixth year. If I, if the author here is not God, you're going to have a very hard time convincing people to believe it. Okay? That is proof number one. Okay? Moving along. What? They believe for six years. They believe for six years? Okay, I don't think they have believed for any years. Okay, so now we have to figure out who wrote this Torah. Okay, we're going now to our next topic. Beautiful things coming up. Now, has anyone ever heard of the festivals? Okay, so again, back to, now we're going back to, again, we're comparing and contrasting what we think a god would or could write as opposed to man. Okay? So imagine I told you, you told, what was your answer before when I asked you what would you write in your Torah? Be nice, okay? Imagine we had a law that says, why don't we all get together? Why don't the entire nation, we're going to get together, we're going to have a good time, and we'll be all right. Yeah? Get this on, right? So anyway, you get together, right? Three times a year, the nation is going to come together, we're going to have a beautiful time, we're all our brothers and sisters, we're all going to get together from the four corners of the world, and we're going to come to Jerusalem right over here on the mountaintop, and we're going to all hang out together. Nice idea? Everybody with me? Yes? Everybody votes for this law? Good. Any problems with this law? Yeah. How are you going to protect everybody? Because that would be a very good time for any enemies to bomb the people. Excellent. I'm going to stop calling on you because you give all the good answers, okay? <laughs> so basically, what was the, we have a big, big problem, right? The big problem is that, okay, now again, I believe in the women and everything like that, but still, to have every Jewish male from the ages of bar mitzvah and up, okay, leave the land, their inhabited land, and come to the Jerusalem, right, to, to spend the holiday and have some women and children stand back and guard the land is not exactly the best idea. Okay, now I don't know how, no, how many of you guys are up, uh, up on current events, but um, Israel, if you look, for example, right now, Israel is not exactly surrounded by the best of friends and neighbors. I'm not sure how much you guys know about that, but let's say, for example, we have about seven Arab countries who pretty much share a common goal of trying to wipe us off the map. Right? So we can relate to this pretty much without getting political in our day and age. Right? Very, very strongly we can understand this message that it's not a very good idea to have everybody just leave right, for a minute. Right? Okay, so imagine we had a law that we had this book. Again, we want everybody to get together. We're all dispersed throughout the world or at least throughout Israel. And everybody's leaving their land and they're coming to spend the beautiful holidays of Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot. Okay? Here we have a nice little map of what's going on. What would you imagine is going to happen? Unfortunately, maybe not such great things may be taking place. But guess what? You know what it says in the Torah? This is what it says. Three times each year, all your males shall appear before God, the Master, Lord of Israel. When I expel the other nations before you and extend your boundaries, what's going to happen? We have a problem here. Well, God, you know, it's very nice. We want to come, but, you know, who's going to take care of it? It says, God, don't worry about it. No one will be envious of your land when you go to be seen in God's presence three times each year. So the author of this book is somehow promising, he's foreseeing the fact that there will be no problem of anybody attacking the people of the land, and they all just leave their homes three times a year and come here, no problem. When I see something like this, there's nothing really that much that I could do besides sitting back and thinking my favorite song.
right? What else can you do? Don't worry, be happy, right? It'll be fine. Okay, so this is a God or a person or somebody writing in their author, in the Torah, this is the author writing, foreseeing somehow that he's going to be able to take care of all the surrounding enemies with no problem. That's what point number two. Okay, so we have the sabbatical here, we have the Shemitah. Point number one. Point number two is we have this mitzvah of leaving our homes three times a year and God telling us, don't worry, be happy, everything will be great. Okay, these are two what we call the psychological proofs. In other words, these are things which don't really make sense that any author of, human, of the human race could really write in their Torah. And therefore, I as the lawyer claim to you, people of the jury, that we have a bit of a sign about the author of this Torah. Okay, now we're moving on to point number three. Point number three goes as follows. There's another idea, probably, you know, if you guys hear about the Jewish religion, so probably one of the things which is most connected to the Jewish religion is kosher, right? It's got to be kosher, right? Kosher now has a more broad meaning, but it comes from here. The concept of what is kosher means there has to be a certain, there are certain things which we're allowed to eat, certain things we're not allowed to eat. We have rules about the things we're allowed to eat, okay? Now again, why someone would write this in their Torah? I don't know. Why would a person write this? Well, I don't know. But let's imagine that for some reason someone want to write this in the Torah. We're going to try to figure out, was this person, this author, a person or God? Okay, so they tell us this law, you got to have kosher animals. Well, let's, take, let's examine a little bit the kosher animals. What are the kosher animals all about? Well, we have a nice little cow there. You guys call him Betsy. Okay? OU. Anyone seen that before? OU? Okay, this is the stamp of approval. It's a kosher animal. So what does that mean? What makes the kosher? It's not just to put the stamp on. There actually has to be something behind the stamp, right? So, number one thing is we have to have split hooves. Okay, you guys aware of that? Anybody have seen this before? Split hooves, okay? So here we have a beautiful cow and we have our split hooves. Okay, moving right along. We have a lot of animals in the animal kingdom. Now let's take a look at what the Torah tells us. God spoke to Moses and Aaron. Tell them to speak to the Israelites and convey the following to them. Of all the animals in the world, these are the ones you may eat. Okay, so God is telling us, you want to know which things you could eat? These, this, this is the rule book right here. Among mammals, you may eat anyone that has true hooves that are cloven and that chews its cud. Okay? This might be a little bit difficult for you guys, but with a bit of rumination, I think we could figure it out. Nobody got that one? Okay, rumination is the word that refers to chewing its gut. Okay, so anyway, so we have chewing its gut. Now, a very interesting law over here, okay? Now, if I gave you this, this, law, this, this law right here, do you know what to do in terms of the animals? Is it pretty clear? Makes sense, right? It's pretty clear, very straightforward, right? Okay, he tells exactly what to do. And by the way, how many mammals are there? Anybody know? A lot, very good. Excellent answer. More than a little? Yeah, right? Okay, so we have about thousands of mammals in the world, okay? Now, now again, but it's not that hard, right? I have the rule book. I take, I take the book. I open it up. Okay, I say, go to the animal. See, let's see. Does it have the split hooves? Does it ruminate? Right? Okay, figure it out, and you'll just apply the rules, no problem. Comes along the Torah for no apparent reason and tells us, you should just know, of the, chew, of the cud chewing animals and the hoofed animals, these are the ones that you may not eat. The Torah now goes to enumerate four different types of animals, which have which characteristics? One out of two. The Torah goes ahead and shows us four different animals in the animal kingdom, which have one out of the two tanaim, conditions which we need in order to have a kosher animal. Now, why is the Torah doing this? Again, imagine you had, for whatever reason, you know, people back then are weird, they wanted to have this law that split hooves, that's what made people feel good, their, their favorite animals were cows, they came up with this law. So they told you, you got to have, again, this author, if he's a man, he for some reason wants to have this law, you got to have split, split hooves, and you got to chew its cud. Why then would the Torah then go to enumerate four different types of animals that have one, but not two, of these conditions? Yeah. Okay, excellent. So therefore, we want to try to, you know, get it, set it in stone here. Make it very clear. Okay, now, that is good. That's a good one. Now, what will be the problem with doing that? Now, remember, this Torah is being passed down about, there are thousands of years. This was written thousands of years ago. Yeah? What if you haven't, like, seen all that? 
Excellent. In other words, by the Torah going out of its way to enumerate these four animals, what is the Torah essentially saying? These are the four animals in the animal kingdom, or mammals at least, okay? Because they're a different set of laws, with different types of animals. In terms of mammals, okay? These are the four mammals which you, may, you should, which you may not eat. Now, it doesn't mean these are the only four which you may not eat, because if it doesn't have any one of these things, you may not eat them either. So there are lots and lots of animals in the animal kingdom which don't have any one of these two signs. They don't have split hooves, and, they don't chew, and it doesn't chew its cut. And there are a lot that have both, right? You have cows, you have sheep, things like that. You have a lot of animals which have both. The Torah now goes and tells us four animals which have one, but not the other. So that means the Torah, like you said, maybe it's a nice idea. The good side of that, okay, make sure that there's no unclarity about it. The bad side is, what if they find another animal, or there's another animal that you haven't seen, that has one of the two? What happens then? That doesn't look very good for the Torah now, does it? Right? Or people won't buy it. So whoever wrote this Torah, the author of this Torah, okay, somehow was privy to the knowledge that there are four animals out of the 5,000 species known to man today, I'm talking about today in the year 2014, of the 5,000 species that are going to be known to man a few thousand years later, four of them, of these mammals, have one but not two of the signs. A little bit presumptuous of a person to write. Everybody agree with me? With me on that? So again, I claim again to you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, that this is a bit of a sign as to who wrote this Torah. Because no man, how smart or maybe foolish as they could be, would ever, ever write such an audacious, presumptuous thing in their Torah had they not been privy to such knowledge. Now, who at that time would be privy to such knowledge other than a godly being? So just to go through it, you have our chart over here. So we got choose its cut, split hooves, that's kosher. Not kosher, or the other one, right? We have our camel, our nevet, and shafan. Okay, camel is the one in English. I never shafan. Uh, it's hard to define exactly in English exactly what they are, but the camel, we know what it is, okay? By the way, the pig is the only one of the four that has split hooves and does not chew its cud. That's why it's a trick, because from the outside, it looks like it's kosher, because it's got the split hooves. But on the inside, it doesn't chew its cud. Okay, so here is point number three which we're telling, this is what we call the informational point. Before the first two laws, we're talking about psychological, right? Why would anybody want to write such an idea in their, in their Torah? Nobody would, nobody would accept it because of the fact that, you know, you're going to tell me I could just leave the land fallow for a year, or I'm just going to leave my house three times a year? Now we have a more of an informational idea. In other words, the author of this book is telling us some crazy information, which is, on the one hand, really gratuitous, right? It's totally superfluous. We don't need it at all. We already know the laws. They're just adding it in just for the kicks of it, number one. And number two, it's opening up Pandora's box because if one, as soon as somebody detects yeah, at that time or any time later in history that there's another one of these animals out there that has one of the two signs, we're in trouble. Okay, so that's point number three. Okay, you can take a look at your uh, mammals chart. Okay, if we have time later, we'll go through those. Okay, we're going to move on to the next idea. Yes, we had a question there? Oh, I'm sorry, you're asking. I'm sorry, I was kind of confused there. Yeah. My bad. Uh, Judaism things generally aren't highlighted for no reason. Is there a reason that they did the, the three animals, the cut and the pig? Excellent. So the Gemara actually says, based on this point, which was just kind of the point of this class, which is this was to show the incredible power that Moses was given by God to actually make such a prediction. That itself was a way to give credibility to the Torah by doing this. No, the fact that, not the prediction, the fact that we're not going to discover any more animals besides these four. So the fact that this was put in there was to actually give us a little bit of credence to the Torah and to Moses himself, exactly for this point. Are That's what we're saying. By any level? Are, are they? they? What was that? Are they elevated for, by any level for having one of the two? Are they elevated? No, they're not elevated at all. In fact, pig is considered to be like the worst thing to eat in Judaism. So it's not really elevated at all. Yeah, go ahead. What do you mean that it's it doesn't ruminate. That's the fancy way of saying it. The truth is, I don't really exactly know that much about it, but the basic idea is that um, the animal, once it, normally when we digest, if we eat the food, it goes into our system and that's it. Certain animals, they chew their cud, they ruminate. After the, the food has already been sent down to the stomach, it regurgitates the food and they chew it again. That's the basic process. If you want to know exactly how it works, um, I'm not a zoologist, but that's the basic idea. Okay, yes? Google it. Google it, exactly. 
Good question. Um, it's a little bit beyond the scope of this class. The truth is, this is one of the laws which are not considered to be the rational laws of the Torah. In other words, there are a section of the Torah laws which we either understand more or less the idea it's a very reasonable law, and there are laws which we don't necessarily understand why God gave it to us, and they gave, He gave them to us for no other purpose than, us, than for us to show Him that we recognize Him as the King and we follow His laws. Is it irrational? What? I wouldn't say it's irrational, just we don't know what the... Okay, well, yeah, but God did not inform us of the reason, okay? Fine, so that is, okay, so that's point number three. Everybody with me? You're not falling asleep, are you? No. Okay, good, fine. Okay, so we had three out of four, okay? We're almost done. Here brings us to point number four, our second one of the informational laws, okay? We have a whole bunch of sea creatures, right? Amazing, beautiful world we have and beautiful sea. What does it say in our Torah about the sea creatures? Again, we're still dealing with the kosher animals, okay? We're moving on to the fish. Among that which is in the water, you may eat anything that has fins and scales. But those which have no fins and scales, you may not eat, since they are unclean to you. Okay? So if you want to know about the fish in the sea or the sea creatures, you want to know which ones you can eat. There are a lot of fish, a lot of creatures in the sea. Which ones can you eat? You got to make sure that it has fins and scales. Okay? Simple. Easy to follow. Not that difficult, right? In fact, we even have a chart over here about what the fish looks like. So we have our scales. We have a lot of different other things, but you have the fins here, okay? So you see different type of fins. So we have fins on the fish, okay? Pretty easy to go through, a pretty easy set of rules. You take the fish, you look at it, you've got the fins and the scales. Okay, let's go through our chart. Fins and scales, kosher or not kosher? Kosher, right? No scales and fins, not kosher, right? No scales. And fins, kosher. Now, what about this? No fins. So let's see, right? You'll say it's not kosher, right? Now, take a look at this. This is now an excerpt from the oral law. Okay, the oral law, which, by the way, was given at the same time as the written law. The oral law has been passed down from generation to generation, and we still have it today, thank God. Okay, you can read it in the text over here, the mission that appears in Maseches Nida, in Tractate Nida. I'm not sure what that means other than Maseches. Anyone heard the word tractate before? Yeah. Tract, yeah, okay. Anyway, tractate, nida, okay? And it says as follows. Every creature that has scales will also have fins. Okay? So every creature that you find that has scales will automatically have fins. But there are those which have fins but do not have scales. Okay? Now, a very interesting anecdotal statement again, right? Now, do we know the point of this statement? Does there seem to be any practical difference that we're going to affect and that's going to apply to our lives based on this statement. Is this adding anything that we didn't know before in terms of practicality? What can I eat? What can I not eat? No. no. As we said before, we go back to our chart. We said, if it has no fins, it's not kosher. We know that. So why do we now have a statement that's telling us every creature that has scales will also have fins, but there are those which have fins but do not have scales. So every creature that has scales will also have fins. Again, what's the point of this statement? Not only that, if you somehow get over the fact that maybe this guy Moses or whoever prophet wrote this Torah was this amazing uh, zoologist, right? Let's say he was a zoologist, okay? And he knew he went around to all the forests and he saw everything. He knows all about every African elephant in the world and he's got it all. He went to rainforest. He's got everything down, right? But the sea, there is no way to see what's going on under the sea, right? You can't see what's going on under the sea because... There's only so far you can go. In fact, nowadays, they're still discovering new creatures. So however smart this guy was, and however much he knew about animal life that was present at that time, there is no way that he would have the ability to know about every sea creature. Okay, even nowadays, they can't, there's so many more, because they're being discovered all the time. There's so many creatures, there's so many layers of the, the depth of the, of the sea is so great that we don't even know how to get to the bottom. Yes? That's exactly the point of the class, right? We believe that the, the oral law and the, and the written law is, were given simultaneously. The oral law was not written down. That's why it was called oral. Okay, it was oral law. And then at a certain later point in history, about 2,000 years ago, approximately 200 CE, it was written down for various reasons. But it remains oral. But that was given at Sinai. Exactly. So how on earth did the rabbis of the Talmud know such a thing? Now, if they were making it up on their own, we have a question. If they're getting it from God, that's exactly the point we're trying to say. Yeah. 
So this is one thing I don't understand. Like Go ahead. First thing for the kosher animals, we've got this conditional statement of and, right? And like the, the evidence is that they foresee the exceptions, right? There's like these four exceptions. Right. And in this one, like we have this conditional statement, which is redundant because we don't, at least to, to current knowledge, because there is nothing that has scales but no fins. So like in the first case, like, oh, don't you see, like, they found the four, you know, things that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, pointed out. And this one, it's like, oh, well, there's this redundant conditional statement, but, like, why is it there? Because you can just say it has to have scales, because if it has scales, it does have fins. Like, you could just say scales, and that would still meet, but that would still meet the criteria. If you said you can only have fish that have scales, there would be no non-kosher fish that uh, would follow that, correct? <clears throat> There would be no non-kosher fish if you there's said no what? Has, there's no fish that has scales but not fins. Right. So you don't need to say um, fins and scales. If you just said scales. Exactly. That's right. exactly. In fact, I'm going to let me read you this quote. Let me read you again. Yeah. First of all, now the redundancy. Remember, here we're talking about the oral law. So this does not appear in the written law, but it's an oral law. Now what it says like this. Exactly your question. Yeah, I'm just reading here from the book because it doesn't appear on the slideshow. Page 26. Anybody that has it? Number four. If so, why... Uh, if so, then why did not God write scales and there would be no need to mention fins, right? If we know that every creature that has scales has fins, so why not just write that every, you want to know what's kosher? It has scales, right? Don't write anything else. Says the Gemara like this, Rebbe Abo replied, and it was also taught at the school of Rebbe Yishmo, in order to magnify the Torah and make it glorious. In other words, we specifically added in to the oral law this seemingly superfluous statement specifically to show the glory of the Torah and to show our pin code, which we're looking for, that the author of this Torah was not a human, was not a person who was living at any time in history because they would have no way of knowing this type of information. And therefore, it must be that the author of this Torah is not a regular human being, man or woman, but rather some supernatural being that we like to refer to as God. Okay? So that is point number four. So let's just recap very quickly. We're looking for a pin code. We're looking to find something about the author, some evidence that the person that sent this message is indeed the person we're trying to connect with. In other words, we want to make sure that this Torah really is being sent by God. If we're claiming that this is the basis of our religion and God told us to do these things, we want to make sure that this is really sent by God and not by some great prophet or some guy later in history who decided to have a good time and make people do a lot of funny laws, right? So we have four basic ideas, two psychological and two informational. Number one, we have idea we have to let the land Lay fell. It makes a lot of sense. A good idea. Problem. Problem is no food to eat. Solution? Crop rotation? No. Import and export? No. What's the solution? Don't worry about it. Three years of abundance. God is going to provide three years of abundance. Makes sense? If the author is a, if a person, not really. If the author is God, makes a lot of sense. Point number two. Jewish unity. Everybody get together three times a year, have a good time, eat, drink, and be merry, right? What about the borders? What about the, what about the safety of the country? What's the answer? Don't worry, be happy. Everything will be great. Again, makes sense. If it's man, no. If God's writing the Torah, it makes a lot of sense. Point number three, our first of the informational ideas, and that is God is telling us, someone is the author is telling us information in this book. You should know that there are four animals which possess one of these two signs of kosher animals. Person writing that, very hard, very difficult a few thousand years ago to foresee such a thing. If it's God, it makes a lot of sense. And the final idea, the three creatures... The sea creatures are of the many, many sea creatures which have not yet at all been discovered. Maybe some of them are still, right, every year probably going to find about some more when they find a new submarine to go a little bit deeper, right? And we have a rule in the oral law. Every single fish that has scales will also have fins. So why is there a necessity to write it? Just write scales in order to show the glory of the Torah, to tell us about the author, that this author was not a man. This was authored by God. And that is our Torah, and that is our pin code for ID Info. Thank you for coming. Mm -hmm.